The Bible reads in the book of Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now we are going to see something very interesting from this story. A new revelation from God. But before we continue, I, I need to establish in your minds an important point. In the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 22, we read this. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Verse 23. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Verse 24. Which things are an allegory? Paul the Apostle establishes a very important biblical principle. Hagar, bond woman, represents those led by the flesh. While Sarah, free woman, represents those led by the Spirit of God. He is showing us that the stories of the Bible were written as an allegory for our day. An example, a figure, a type, a shadow that parallels exactly what God's people will be going through at the end of time. Jonah was a layperson, not on salary, and he was called by God to go to that great city Nineveh and to cry against it. The great city spoken of in the book of Jonah is a direct reference to that great city Babylon written about in Revelation 18 verse 10. Jonah, he's called to go and cry against it. Also interesting is the fact that Nineveh is located northeast. And the spirit of prophecy speaks about a mighty work, a mighty move of God happening in the northeast. So much so that she says the brethren all the way in the west coast need to support the workers in the northeast with their tithe. Imagine that! The Bible tells us that the natural is a reflection of the spiritual. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 46. So much so that God even likens the outpouring of His Spirit to rain. The early rain and the latter rain. Joel chapter 2 verse 23. As scientists over the years have studied hurricanes, they have observed something very interesting. Each storm system has a very similar structure. These common structures allow the hurricane to be divided into four quadrants based on the location of the eye. The northwest quadrant, the southwest quadrant, the northeast quadrant in the southeast quadrant. The northeast quadrant is always the most powerful part of the storm. The strongest winds, the heaviest rainfall. We're talking about maximum impact. Some of you are catching the spiritual implications of all this. The Bible reads in the book of Daniel chapter 11 verse 44, but tidings out of the east and out of the north northeast shall trouble him the king of the north brothers and sisters i want to tell you something power is about to return to the northeast Now, when we think about an exceedingly great city in the northeast of the United States, what city comes to mind? New York City. This is also fascinating because the spirit of prophecy says that New York is going to be the symbol at the end of time.
Now who would Jonah represent? Who are the spiritual Jews today? Without doubt, they are Seventh-day Adventists. No one else has the three angels' message. No one else has the heavenly sanctuary doctrine. No one else has the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 19, 10. Inspiration clearly tells us that it is going to be the lay people that give that loud cry to Babylon. But Jonah goes down to Hapa and pays that fare to get on that ship. There's a lot of talk lately among Seventh-day Adventists regarding the ship. You probably have heard the phrase, we need to stay on the ship or the ship is going through. The ship represents the general conference. And members of the denomination are not the only ones that make this analogy with the ship. The prophet of God also speaks about the ship. This is what she says. Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. She goes on to say the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist of giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what will result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of this new movement. The leaders would teach their virtues better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. She also says, quote, and when once these deluded souls have departed from the old landmarks of faith, they had let go their anchor and were tossed about like the waves of the sea. So based on the above statements, it's very clear. The general conference we see today is that new organization, the prophet compares it to a ship without an anchor headed into an apocalyptic storm at sea. You see, this ship that everyone's talking about is headed for disaster. Recall 
from the story of Jonah, the ship is leaving the presence of the Lord. Jonah 1, 3, I'm going to say that again. The ship is leaving the presence of the Lord. Do not think it's just an accident that this whole episode with Jonah and the ship is recorded in sacred writings. God is speaking to Seventh-day Adventists. Jonah paid that fare to go on that ship. Tarshish was not exactly around the corner, brothers and sisters. The fare paid by Jonah was not a small sum of money. To be a part of that ship, today, you need to pay that fare. How do you become a, quote, member in good standing at your local conference church? You give them your tithes. You pay that fare to go down to that ship and sleep. And that's what Jonah did. And that's exactly what Seventh-day Adventists are doing today. It would be wise. Instead of invest your money in that ship to give to self-supporting ministries. Especially those who are going straight to that great city Babylon to give that loud cry. No conference affiliations. The story continues. As Jonah is fast asleep in the bottom of the ship, the marinas find themselves in the midst of a tempestuous storm. The shipmaster comes down to Jonah and tells him to arise. Call upon his God. Jonah 1.6 The shipmaster represents Christ, who is the captain of our salvation. Hebrews 2.10 And even if we have run away from God as Jonah did, our Savior bids us to come back to him. Quote, In that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Romans 13.11 It is the storm at sea, aka a climate crisis, that causes Jonah to be brought to the forefront. I want you to notice this statement from the pen of inspiration. Every position of truth taken by our people will bear the criticism of the greatest minds. The highest of the world's great men will be brought in contact with truth and therefore every position we take should be critically examined and tested by the scriptures. Now we seem to be unnoticed. Jonah sleeping in the bottom of the ship. But this will not always be. Movements are at work to bring us to the front. And if our theories of truth can be picked to pieces by historians or the world's greatest man, it will be done. It is also interesting to note that on page 237 of the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis calls for the world to embrace Sunday sacredness to solve the climate crisis. You see, it will be the storm at sea, the climate crisis, that will bring Jonah, Seventh-day Adventist, to the forefront. As we continue to read the story of Jonah, we see that because the storm is very tempestuous, the mariners call upon their gods. It is within the context of a climate crisis that we see the men on the ship gather together ecumenically. What I find to be even more fascinating is that the official symbol for the worldwide ecumenical movement is a ship. And what is currently happening within the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists? There is a blatant movement of ecumenicism within our ranks, happening all the way from the General Conference level down to your local church. The entire theological curriculum at our universities is steeped 
in ecumenicism. Pastors are being trained to pit aside sound doctrine to get a little closer to the daughters of Babylon. I want to tell you a true story. In the year 2016, I was miraculously hired by the Central California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. It was a miracle because not only did I not have credentials, but my ministerial experience was very unorthodox. However, I had a friend, we will call him Santiago, who worked high in the conference, who gave me the position of being a cross trainer for the Cambrian Park and Los Gatos Seventh-day Adventist churches. In essence, this would entail me giving Bible studies and doing evangelism training. You can see here me preaching for the Cambrian Park Seventh-day Adventist Church on Sabbath, July 30th, 2016 in San Jose, California. When I flew out to California, the conference pit me in a paid training program, kind of like an apprenticeship. They pit me under their top Bible worker. We will call his name Josiah. When I met Josiah, I immediately liked the guy. He was a friendly African-American man with a big smile and a loving family. He was down to earth and when he saw me, a young man beginning to work for the Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, he desired to let me know what is really going on behind the scenes. He brought me into his office and closed the door. He told me that what he was about to tell me, he wouldn't even tell the pastor. He gave me a sheet of paper and began to tell me about the history of the Jews. At one point in history, the Jews had a pure, untainted system in which their priests were trained in the ministry. But by the time of the Greeks, something happened. The Greeks saw the potential of the young Jewish men and suggested to the Jews that if they were to adopt some of their Babylonian methods of education, it would transform the Jewish nation for the better. This Hellenization of the Jews led to a compromise in which their priesthood was corrupted. This worldly education ultimately blinded them from seeing Jesus Christ as the Messiah. How tragic. Spirit of Prophecy says this, our Savior did not encourage any to attend the rabbinical schools of his day for the reason that their minds would be corrupted with the continual repeated they say or it has been said why then should we accept the unstable words of men as exalted wisdom when a greater a certain wisdom is at our command ministry of healing 449 Josiah then told me the same thing is happening all over again the worldly education that seven day Adventists have adopted will ultimately lead them to receive the mark of the beast Josiah then told me his testimony. He was raised in a Pentecostal home. His father was a Pentecostal minister. He grew up going to church on Sunday, but always questioned it. Sometimes he would approach his father and he would give him the typical, the law was nailed at the cross arguments. But this would not appease him. Something wasn't adding up. One day, when he was all grown up and had a family of his own, he came across 3ABN on television. He saw a preacher break down the Sabbath from the Bible in such a clear way that there was no turning back. He went to his father in boldness and told him that he and his family will start keeping holy the Sabbath day. 
His father let him know that he is free to make that decision. That's between him and God. But as for him, he is sticking with the Sunday tradition. The Lord would next lead Josiah to a Sabbath-keeping church. One Sabbath, as Josiah and his family were driving down a road in Central California, he saw a church parking lot filled up on a Saturday. He was amazed at the sight, and like Moses, he drew near. He did not even know about Seventh-day Adventists. He thought him and his family were the only ones keeping the Sabbath in that whole city. Who are Seventh-day Adventists? He was amazed that there was actually a church with people coming together to worship on the Sabbath day. As he came in the church, he sat in the back. He did not know what to expect. Were they still going to do animal sacrifices? He sat near the exit just in case. But as the beautiful service continued, there were no sacrifices of lambs. Just people seeking the Lord together. It was at that moment that something supernatural took place. As he looked up at the pulpit, a supernatural voice spoke to him. God audibly told him, you will become the preacher of this church. No one else heard the voice, just him. As time progressed, he began attending that church. People saw the love of Jesus shining through him, and he soon became an elder in the church. The church saw clearly his calling to be a minister and paid his way to AFCO, where he received training from Pastor Doug Batchelor. After he came back from AFCO, a series of events transpired and the pastor that was at that church was transferred to another church. In the natural order of things, Josiah was chosen to lead the flock. He began to preach in the same pulpit that the Lord had spoken of. The prophecy was fulfilled. The Holy Ghost attended his preaching and people drove for miles just to attend this church. He preached in that pulpit for three and a half years, ministering just like Jesus. It reached maximum capacity and the conference saw that Josiah was clearly ordained by God to be a minister of the gospel. The conference told Josiah, we will pay for your education. It's time to go to Andrews University and get yourself a degree, son. Initially, Josiah was excited. They would pay his way to Andrews University? That can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But there was a still small voice in the back of his mind saying, don't go. At that time, they lived on a country property that was owned by Roman Catholics. She was so excited that her husband Josiah was going back to school to get an education, fully paid. While speaking to the owner, she said, my husband is going back to school. They were intrigued. Which school is he going to? He would be going to Andrews Seminary to get a Master's of Divinity degree. The Catholics could see her excitement, but they told her that that school is Catholic. They are well acquainted with Andrew's seminary. Josiah's wife was offended. That is not a Catholic school, she said. I'm speaking about Andrew's seminary in Bering Springs, Michigan. It's a Seventh-day Adventist school. The Catholics were quiet. Then they said to her, yes, we know which school you are talking about. That is our school. Troubled at this saying, she went and told Josiah. He immediately began to investigate. The still small voice in his head was telling him, don't go. Even though the conference was urging him to do so. He found that the concept of theology degrees came from the Greeks. 
and that the curriculum in our seminaries is poisoned with the wine of Babylon. The word seminary comes from the Latin word semen. This is where Satan inseminates future ministers with his seed. Six years to master divinity. History is repeating and just as the Jews were unprepared for the first coming of Jesus, in like manner Seventh-day Adventists will be unprepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. As Paul sat in Josiah's office, his heart was filled with joy. He knew something was off with the seminary, and this was a confirmation from heaven. At that time, he got a text from his sister Rose, who was all the way in Florida. Rose was led by the Spirit of God to send the following verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1-7. through This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, SDAs. I'll say that again. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. This is talking about Seventh-day Adventists. This is talking about what's happening in the house of God. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Verse 7, ever learning and never, never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Verse 7 speaks about a crisis among God's people at the end of time surrounding education. They are ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Who is the truth? It's Jesus, John 14, 6. Paul was amazed that Rose would send him this text as Josiah was telling him about the crisis in our educational system. This was a divine appointment. When Paul told Josiah about that verse, Josiah said that is exactly what is happening in the conference with our pastors. Even after they come out of our universities poisoned with the wine of Babylon, there is a re-educational procedure, a recertification process that they undergo from the conference every so often. It's kind of like the Bill Gates vaccine. One jab is not enough. Gotta go back for those booster shots. Ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now I want to get back to the story of Jonah. I hope that with what I just shared, you can see a little more clearly that the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists is indeed that ship of ecumenicism. One of the very first things the mariners ask Jonah is, what is your occupation? Because that's what's truly important on the ship. The 501c3 tax-exempt status runs in the salaries of its congregants. During the loud cry, we will no longer have formal employment. Jonah is now thrown over the ship into the boisterous sea. It is then that a great sea beast swallows him up. Where else do we read about a great beast from the sea in the Bible? Without a doubt, it's Revelation 13.1, the Roman Catholic Church. 
Jonah describes being in the belly of the beast as being in, quote, hell, Jonah 2.2. He has three long days where he reflects on his decision in running from God and ultimately repents. Notice what the spirit of prophecy says. In the charge given him, Jonah had been entrusted with a heavy responsibility. Yet, he who had bidden him go was able to sustain his servant and grant him success. Had the prophet obeyed unquestioningly, he would have been spared many bitter experiences. I'll say that again. Had the prophet obeyed unquestioningly, he would have been spared many bitter experiences and would have been blessed abundantly. Yet in the hour of Jonah's despair, the Lord did not desert him. Through a series of trials and strange providences, the prophet's confidence in God and in his infinite power to save was to be revived prophets and kings he could have just went to Nineveh to give that loud cry by doing self-supportive work but by getting on that general conference ship he has a direct collision course with the Roman Catholic sea beast notice this statement from inspiration those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions and the decree to compel conscience. And even if, if it's a gamble, they endure the test, they will be plunged down into that sea, plunged into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they have never made it a habit to trust in God. The lessons of faith which they have neglected, they will be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement. Great Controversy 622. Some may be thinking if Jonah got away with being on the ship and ultimately was saved, I'll be fine. I'd rather not choose to suffer now. Well, I will warn you with this. While it is true that Jonah represents a class of Seventh-day Adventists that learn the hard way and are ultimately saved, Jonah also represents the lost. What do I mean? You see, what happens in Jonah chapter 4 is very significant. Jonah is very angry at God and questions God for everything he has done, sparing Nineveh, allowing the worm to smote the gourd. This represents those who are unwilling to repent, and they put human reasoning above God, and they receive the mark of the beast. In verse 8, God prepares a vehement east wind, and the sun beats upon the head of Jonah. This typifies the seven last plagues remember that in the fourth plague the sun is given power to scorch men revelation 16 8 the bible says these plagues will be so great that men shall seek death but shall not find it revelation 9 6 and that's exactly what happens to jonah as the sun scorches him he wishes for death jonah 4 8 Jonah also represents a class of Seventh-day Adventists who have compromised by being on that ship and will ultimately receive the mark of the beast and receive the seven last plagues. Jonah is then vomited onto dry land. Jesus vomits those who are lukewarm. Revelation 3, verse 16. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise! Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days journey. 
And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. The story of Jonah is fascinating on many accounts. First of all, Jonah is a biblical outlier. What do I mean by that? The vast majority of the prophets, i.e. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Elijah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Amos, Malachi, just to name a few, were sent primarily to the house of Israel for their rebellion against God. It is extremely rare for a Old Testament prophet to be sent directly to the heathens and not to Israel. This is highly significant prophetically. And Jonah wasn't sent just to any city. Nineveh, that great city, was the New York of his day. They were the chief of all sinners. Inspiration says this, in the time of its temporal prosperity, Nineveh was a center of crime and wickedness. Inspiration has characterized it as, quote, the bloody city, full of lies and robbery. In figurative language, the prophet Nahum compared the Ninevites to a cruel, ravenous lion upon whom he inquired, hath not thy wickedness passed continually Nahum chapter 3 verse 1 and verse 19 for the entire city of Nineveh to repent is nothing short of a miracle of Almighty God it is by far one of the greatest evangelistic successes in all of the scripture it is a glimpse into what we shall shortly experience during the loud cry of the fourth angel but before I go there, I would like for us to see what Jesus Christ says about the story of Jonah. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, Jesus says this, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold! A greater than Jonas is here. In his rebuke to the Pharisees, Jesus Christ himself praised Nineveh and condemned Seventh-day Adventist. I want to let you know something. This is a pattern. Repeatedly, Jesus shows us the lost state of his own people, Seventh-day Adventist, and directs us to his people which are still in Babylon. Notice in Matthew chapter 8 verses 5 through 13 a Roman centurion approaches Christ beseeching him to heal his servant who is sick of palsy. When Jesus says I will come heal him the centurion says he is not worthy for Christ to enter under his roof. Speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Jesus then marvels at such faith and rebukes Israel of their lack of faith. He says in verse 11, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus here again denounces the sins of Israel and shows us there is hope for the heathen. He bids the centurion to go on his way and says, As thou hast believed, so it be done unto thee. His servant is healed in that self same hour. In Matthew chapter 11 verses 20 through 24, Jesus calls woes upon the Jewish cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida because they repented not. And he says that the heathen cities of Tyre and Sidon would have repented if they saw these mighty miracles. 
He even goes as far as to say that Jewish city, Capernaum, will be brought down to hell. And it will be even more tolerable for Sodom in the judgment than for Capernaum. Yes, it's shocking. And yes, that is actually in the scriptures. Now I want us to read what the Bible says in Malachi chapter 1 verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name, my name shall be great amongst the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great amongst the heathen saith the Lord of hosts. Here the prophet Malachi prophesies of a great day when God's glory will shine among the heathen. What happened in the story of Jonah? The whole city repents. The whole city of Nineveh, those heathens, repent from the least to the greatest. With that in mind, I would like to turn to the book of Daniel chapter 11 verse 41. Daniel chapter 11 verse 41 it says this and he the king of the north shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown but these shall escape out of his hand even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon this verse parallels exactly what we have been talking about. The king of the north represents Satan. According to Daniel chapter 11 verse 27, the king of the north is a king of lies. Satan is the father of all lies. John chapter 8 verse 44. Satan calls himself the king of the north in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 13. Furthermore, when the Bible says that the king of the north shall enter into the glorious land, this is a reference to Jerusalem slash God's people. Daniel chapter 8 verse 9, Psalms chapter 48, 1 through 3. In John chapter 8 verse 44, Jesus rebukes the Jews and says Satan is their father. In essence, he is saying that Satan is their king. We see here in type Satan entering into the glorious land, a.k.a. God's own people. However, the Bible does not end here. But the verse finishes by saying, quote, These shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. This is huge. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 34 through 38, we see Lot's two daughters get him drunk and commit incest with him, starting with the firstborn the first night. In verse 34, the oldest daughter says that this is done so, quote, that we may preserve seed of our father, end quote. I want to let you know that she is not talking about preserving the seed of her father Lot. This abominable act of incest is done to preserve the seed of her father, Satan. You see, the firstborn ends, ends up getting pregnant from this act and has a son that, is the, that becomes the father of the Moabites. The second daughter also gets pregnant from this despicable act and has a son which becomes the father of the children of Ammon. To give you some historical context, Moab and Ammon as well as Edom were heathen nations that lie geographically to the east of Israel. They were satanic kingdoms dedicated to the worship of Satan. These were nations that Solomon was explicitly warned by God not to intermarry with. But we all know what ended up happening in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7 and 8. In Solomon's alliance with the daughters of Ammon and Moab, uh, he was led to start serving Satan in the worship of the gods Chamash and Molech. 
In Isaiah chapter 34, verse 5 and 6, we see God's curse and judgments pronounced on Edom for their great wickedness in serving Satan. Now, let's get to the good part. Even though it is clear that Edom, Moab, and Ammon are under the control of the king of the north, a.k.a. Satan, the Bible says his people are there as well. Amos chapter 9, 11 through 12, and Isaiah chapter 11, 11 through 14. God is saying, I have people in Babylon. When the Bible says the chief of the children of Ammon, this is highly significant. The original Hebrew word for chief is strong 7225, resheth, which means prominent, choicest, finest. In closing, I want to tell you the sad reality is that Satan has entered the glorious land. It is going to be a tragic ending for Seventh-day Adventists just like it was for the Jews. In fact, we, we are even told by inspiration Satan will take many of God's key players. A very small remnant will be left in Israel just like Gideon's 300 men. Quote, The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. And this time the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many, many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will appear in the shame of their own nakedness. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 80 and 81. However, God plays fair. I want to let you guys know something. God plays fair. He sees Satan entering the glorious land, a.k.a. the Seventh-day Adventist church. He sees Satan taking his pastors, his elders, his evangelists, his co-porters, gaining control of the general conference. God says, you know what, Satan? I'm going to make this an even playing field. I'm going to go into Babylon and take some of your key players. Even Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Ammon. Nearest to the throne are those who were once zealous for the cause of Satan. I'm going to say that again. Nearest the throne of God are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan. But who plucked as brands from the burning have followed their Savior with Deep, intense devotion. Next are those who perfected Christian characters in the midst, they're in the midst of falsehood and infidelity. Those who honored the law of God when the Christian world declared it void and the millions of all ages who were martyred for their faith. And beyond is the quote, great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds, people and tongues, before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with the white robes and palms in their hands, Revelation 7, 9. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, and I look, and lo, a Lamb standing upon Mount Zion and with him. 144,000. The Bible tells us that those who are closest to God's throne are the 144,000. But we are also told that those who God plucks from Satan's hand will be closest to his throne. This leads us to conclude that a spiritual army from Babylon will comprise a large part of the 144,000. 
We are not ready for the fire they are about to bring. I want to let you know, friends, that God is already preparing that army. He's already even giving us hints as to who he is planning to pluck out. The people in the following picture were not put there by accident. Each of the people you see in this picture, the Lord has given dreams, visions, signs that he is getting ready to bring them out of Babylon. I will use Beyonce as an example. We all know that Beyonce is a key player right now in Satan's camp. She would be considered a, quote, chief of the children of Ammon. I want to let you know that the Lord has given to my sister Rose the gift of dreams. God gives spiritual gifts. But there's something unusual and unique and prophetic about Rose's gift of dreams. I want to let you know that there was a time when God did something to me. Something supernatural. Something strange in my life. And I kept it secret from my sister Rose. However, the Lord came to Rose in a dream revealing exactly what had happened to me. It was a rebuke to me for keeping this thing secret from my sister. I'm dead serious when I say these things. God did something supernatural and secret in my life. And God revealed the exact thing to Rose in a dream without me saying anything. The sister Rose has been given the gift of dreams. And now with that said, in the February of this year, 2022, she had a vivid dream about Beyonce. She has had repeated dreams of Beyonce coming to the third angel's message. We're talking about Beyonce coming out of Babylon. In this dream, Rose was invited to a special, lavish, private party. Jay-Z and Beyonce were there and some other elite guests. Rose was some kind of spiritual advisor to Beyonce. And Beyonce was, was reverent and would listen very closely when Rose would speak. Because Beyonce knew that Rose's words came from the Most High God. Jay-Z wasn't too thrilled about Rose being there, but he was tolerating Rose there because Beyonce wanted my sister Rose at this private gathering. In the dream, she was given a candle in a special ceremony. And Rose then gave this candle directly to Beyonce. The spiritual significance of a candle in the Bible is letting your light shine and witnessing to others. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. In the dream, Beyonce had short hair at neck length. Rose awoke from the dream and out of curiosity looked up Beyonce on the internet. And I want to let you know that Rose rarely looks up Beyonce. Rose is not following celebrities like that. It just so happened that that day an article was posted saying Beyonce just got a short haircut at neck length. Just like the dream. Do you honestly think that this is just all coincidence? God is about to take his Rahab out of Jericho. Jesus says unto us in Matthew chapter 21 verses 31. Whether of them twain did the will of his father. They said unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them verily. I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Luke 5, 32. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Isaiah 59, 1-4. Revelation chapter 18, 1-4 says this. 
And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of devils. A hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich to the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that God is preparing an army that is going to come out of Babylon and finish this work. It is going to be a tragic ending for the Seventh-day Adventist. The vast majority of them will be lost. They will be our worst enemies at the end of time. But God's glory will shine amongst the heathen. Those who are in the darkest, filthiest places of this earth will come to his light. Father, I thank you for those who have watched this presentation. I pray it was a blessing, Father, and that you will use this message to encourage. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I thank you so much for watching this presentation. I pray it was a blessing to you. And that now you will look at the story of Jonah in an entirely new way. Please keep Flames Ministry in your prayers. And if you are impressed by the Lord, the QR code to donate is on the screen and the link to donate is below. As always, this has been a Flames Ministry presentation where we are giving that trumpet a certain sound. God bless you.